case, good evening and welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Charles Stang. I'm the director here at the center, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Professor Francesca Cho from Georgetown University to the center to deliver the annual Ann Cook Lecture in Korean Buddhism. Uh, but before I introduce Professor Cho and the lecture series, um, permit me a quick public service announcement. Please turn off your phone <laughs> or just silence it. Um, so a very brief word about the Ann Cook Lecture in Korean Buddhism. This lecture is made possible by a generous gift from the Ven Venerable Su Bul of the Ann Cook Zen Center in memory of the Venerable Bup Jong. Forgive me if I am murdering those names. Uh, my Korean is rusty. Um, and it's a gift in support of Korean Buddhism broadly defined. It was a gift um, in the year 2006, I believe. And previous speakers have included professors Sung Bae Park in 2012, Jin Park in 2014, and Donald Baker in 2016. Um, I'd like to thank the staff of the CSWR who've made this event, as all, all events here, possible, especially Corey O'Brien, the associate director, and Ariella Ruth, the center's events coordinator. And a particular word of thanks to my colleague, um, Charles Hallisey, the Yehan Numata Senior Lecturer in Buddhist Literature here at HDS. Charlie is a member of the Center's Advisory Board, and since this is my first year as the Center's Director, I turned to him immediately for advice on whom to invite to this uh, annual lecture. It was Charlie who introduced me to Professor Cho's scholarship and who had the idea to bend this lecture to the topic of film. So thank you, Charlie, for your counsel. Finally, let me introduce Professor Cho. Those of you who know me know that I favor brief introductions because I'm sure you're not here to hear me speak about Korean Buddhism, but instead her. Professor Cho is Professor of Buddhist Studies at Georgetown University. She works in the area of East Asian Buddhism and culture, particularly through non-canonical media like fiction, poetry, and film. Her courses include Introduction to Buddhism, Buddhism and Film, Religion and Aesthetics, and Buddhism and Christianity in the Secular World. In addition to a number of articles, she has written two books, Embracing Illusion, Truth and Fiction in the Dream of the Nine Clouds, that's 1996, and in 2005, Everything Yearned For, Manhe's Poems of Love and Longing. She received her BA in Religious Studies from Brown University and her MA and PhD in Religion and History of Religion from the University of Chicago. Professor Cho, we're delighted that you could join us this evening, and we're all looking forward to your talk entitled Ritual Apparitions and a Buddhist Theory of Film. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to give uh, this year's Anguk lecture. Uh, so let me begin by saying that when I was encouraged uh, to speak on the topic of Buddhism and film, on which I've uh, recently published, I decided this would be a good opportunity for me to you know, think about what's next. Uh, so instead of recapitulating uh, my recent book, uh, this is new material that I've uh, put together specifically for the purpose of this talk, and so it's a work in progress. Um, so um, hopefully the ideas aren't half-baked, but they're half-polished, so I look forward to your responses to help me um, further my thinking on this topic. So without further ado, um, my objective here is to construct a Buddhist theory of film that sees it as a religious medium. And I'm distinguishing this task from that of determining what kind of qualities and contents make for a Buddhist movie, right? So um, the previous book was really about uh, movies that can be defined or defended as being Buddhist, but now, um, I want to 
make the point that not all films function in Buddhist ways by virtue of its medium alone. And so for that reason, we need explicit criteria for how, uh, for determining how and when a movie is in fact Buddhist. A Buddhist theory of film, on the other hand, considers the phenomenon of film in the abstract, right, above and beyond any particular movies uh, and their content to consider how cinema can function religiously at all, right? And to give you um, a sense of where I'm going, my punchline is that film can be theorized as a ritual apparition uh, in line with the magical bodies spoken of and theorized in Mahayana Buddhist texts. So that's essentially my argument. Now I'm gonna start with a methodological um, aside and I also get to sort of show a picture of uh, the book on Buddhism and film that came out about a year ago. Um, this book claims that films can replicate and function like Buddhist rituals, uh, whether it's in the mode of, say, enlivening Buddha images and treating them as living beings, uh, or meditating on the aging process, um, or um, cultivating um, detached uh, and sustained modes of perception. Right? So that's the general argument of the book which uh, examines uh, films chapter by chapter. Now, one of the th things that I didn't really address in the book, though, is what kind of claim is this when I say that Buddhist, I mean, films can function as Buddhist ritual? Is it, for example, descriptive uh, and ethnographic? Well, no, I mean, I didn't bother to do historical research or cultural research to see if in fact Buddhists are treating film uh, as a ritual medium uh, and context. They may very well be, but I can't make that claim uh, because I haven't done that kind of work. Uh, is my uh, project here prescriptive and constructive? Am I recommending that Buddhists ought to interact with film uh, in the mode of Buddhist religious ritual? Well, no, I mean, I don't see myself as being in a position to make such a recommendation. Um, I'm certainly not opposed to it, but I don't see that as my role here either. So in putting together this Buddhist theory uh, of film, it's also an opportunity for me to be very explicit uh, about what I am doing and what my mode of scholarship is. And I don't think there's a, a pat word for it, um, but I would describe it as using Buddhist thought, which in one sense, Buddhism is the object of my study, but I'm using it to supply the theory and interpretation for a cross-cultural phenomenon, and in this case, uh, the global phenomenon of film. And so what this entails is a reversal of the usual epistemic subject-object relationship in which you know, if Buddhism is the object of study, you might use a Western theory to unpack it and interpret it. Well, what I'm doing instead is the reverse. I use Buddhist thought and practice as the source uh, of my theory. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, a way of um, creating a, a process of self-reflexivity, where if we get the theoretical materials from a different culture, it's an opportunity to reflect on some of our own um, sort of axiomatic assumptions when we theorize, uh, whether about our own cultural artifacts or those of others. So, um, essentially what interests me here is a Buddhist theory of film entailing a general understanding of what the phenomenon of cinema is um, universally. All right, why is this interesting? Well, um, my work and thinking is always comparative. And because Buddhist thinking uh, operates in a epistemic framework that's significantly different from our own default traditions, I think that leads to very different insights. 
Um, and these insights can be useful to us, again, beyond the confines of Buddhist tradition itself. So I'm going to make some generalizations here about different epistemic frameworks, the Buddhist and uh, the Western philosophical ones. So in my um, preliminary survey of Western philosophy of film, which is a literature that I've started looking into, uh, what I find is that it generally skews to Western philosophy overall, which prefers a referential concept of reality as something that exists outside of perceiving minds and their representations uh, of that world. So this framework is really apparent in um, debates, for example, about whether or not photographic and cinematic images are identical with the things that they depict or merely representations of them in, in the manner of a painting. And so it's interesting, I just came from the Wim Wenders uh, lecture and he began his comments by talking about his first phase of filmmaking where he was really, really obsessed with uh, how cinema can capture uh, material reality, right? The things of, of the external world and this, yes, was very much in the consciousness of, I think, early uh, theorizing uh, about film. So you've, um, I've read about debates um, about, say, you have a cinematic uh, um, images of the Empire State Building, for example. Uh, is this an image, an instance of transparency uh, similar to looking out your window and seeing the Empire State Building, right? Uh, so uh, this debate, which is controversial, some people would say, I don't see why a painting isn't like that as well. I'm not concerned about the right or wrong answer here, but rather what the debate assumes, which is this baseline philosophical category of objective reality, right? Or what is ontologically real and film's relationship to it. Uh, another example of the kind of debate that I've come across is the philosophical problem known as the paradox of fiction, which ponders why we have emotional responses to movies, um, you know, feature films, when we know that its stories and characters are fictional. Uh, what interests me is not the answers to these questions, but what these debates reveal. Uh, about the assumptions that give rise to them in the first place. So obviously I'm gonna start with a different met, um, epistemic framework. Um, and specifically, uh, that would be the penchant of Buddhists to state that what we take to be reality itself is a projection of mind and ultimately an illusion. And that therefore the images both inside of our own heads and outside uh, supposedly uh, in, in the objective world, uh, equally exert a tremendous power uh, over us and has an ability uh, to entrance us. So this idea not only affirms the equivalence between the experiences generated, say, by art and film in particular, obviously, uh, on the one hand, and by life on the other, uh, this epistemic framework suggests the greater power of art to produce religious effects. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, defending this idea, except to say that this is what my work on literature, uh, fiction and poetry in the East Asian and Korean Buddhist contexts have pretty much consisted of. And uh, I'm not going to talk about these specific sources, uh, much of which have been Korean, so the fiction of Kim Man Jung or the poetry of Han Yong Un, because Charlie told me that it's okay if I don't speak, uh, speak specifically about the Korean materials. But then Charlie just told me earlier this afternoon that he's known for lying, so maybe he was lying about that. But, you know, I'm just, so this is the sort of source materials I've looked at, and to summarize it, um, but not, of course, confining it to Korea, but uh, the East Asian Buddhist context. So in traditional East Asian Buddhism, 
the affective experiences generated by literature are seen as powerful forms of religious insight and practice. And reflections on fiction, for example, uh, play on the Buddhist themes of interchangeability between truth and illusion and suggest that the life of the imagination can be more powerful than ordinary experiences in awakening people uh, to the truth of illusion. So a consequential difference that results from these different epistemic frameworks can be seen in the way Western traditions tend to segregate art, including film, from the higher callings of religion and philosophy, right? On the principle that while these art forms can represent and maybe engage religious themes, it can never function as religion itself, right? Merely a, a representation. And I think um, in the case of the Buddhist concept of illusion, uh, we're driving more towards an identity between art forms such as film and religion itself. Uh, so an interesting question being, uh, can cinema itself be understood as uh, religion? Now, in order to uh, test this sort of comparative difference that I've generally sketched out, it's always a good idea to try to look for examples that contradict uh, the general thesis. And so um, one of the realms I've been looking at is uh, early French phenomenology uh, of film, which goes by the, uh, the, the word uh, filmology, and it's uh, associated with um, particularly Andre Bazin and his you know, students or followers, at least intellectually, Amade Eif and Henri Agel, and um, whose thoughts were introduced to American audiences by Paul Schrader, uh, the filmmaker and film theorist, uh, in his book, Transcendental Style in Film, uh, in which he focuses on the directors Yasujiro Ozu, Robert Bresson, and Carl Dreyer. Um, this phenomenological philosophical reflection on the spiritual capabilities of film generally claims that cinema can lead the viewer to the sacred, uh, not through overtly religious subject matter, but through particular film styles. Uh, and the favorite style is documentary style realism with techniques such as uh, deep focus, long sustained shots, uh, close-ups of faces to ca uh, capture subtle expressions. Uh, and the resulting experience is thought to give the viewer access to the ineffable and transcendent via the immediacy and intensity of cinematic experience, which is recognizing, uh, recognized as possessing the power to transform our perceptions of the world. Um, I, even though this um, book by Schrader came out in the early 70s and I think has just been reissued from, from what I hear with uh, a new introduction by Schrader and Bazan, uh, Aif and Agel, they were working primarily in the 40s and 50s and they, they got eclipsed by the semiotic interpretation of film. I think this lineage of thought is still uh, with us today uh, as evidenced by this more recent publication, uh, 2016, Dreams, Doubt, and Dread, the Spiritual in Film, uh, which uh, continues uh, the earlier legacy and its desire to go beyond overt religious themes to address how film is, quote, a singularly wonderful means of addressing our senses. Um, it emphasizes, the essays, it's a collection, emphasizes the intentional, intense emotional impact of cinema and its ability to open up the imagination. And this phenomenological approach wants to shift contemporary theological film engagement away from a simple mode of analysis in which theological concepts are simply read into the film itself 
and to begin to let films speak for themselves as profoundly spiritual experiences. So that's a direct quotation from the introductory uh, essay. Now, I'm gonna, so I'm suggesting that there, there's some perhaps similarities here in this tradition of thought to the um, theory of uh, film that I'm presenting, but I'm going to say it falls rather short for a couple of reasons. This tradition appears to focus on the medium of film rather than on religious content. So, you know, uh, people like Schrader and this idea of the transcendental style, they hate movies like the Ten Commandments, right? It's just kitschy, it's Hollywood, it, it, it doesn't truly capture uh, the spiritual that, that cinema is able to um, convey. Um, but because it privileges a particular style of filmmaking, that of realism, I think it falls short of a comprehensive account of cinema and focuses on film techniques rather than on the medium uh, itself. It's claimed that a certain style of film leads to an experience uh, of the sacred is, I think, challenged by the relativity of individual as well as cross-cultural tastes. Uh, for example, I think uh, some people have found the Ten Commandments to be a very spiritual uh, film. Or to take a more recent example, what about Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ? I mean, that was explicitly treated uh, as a Christian religious ritual in tandem with Bible study before going into the, the movie st uh, theater. So you have the challenge of the relativity of tastes uh, and uh, also the power of cinema uh, to move us uh, is easily unpacked by explanations other than a reference to the sacred. So uh, currently philosophers of film borrow uh, from cognitive science to talk about uh, what they call perceptual realism and the fact that the audiovisual nature of film activates the same cognitive sensory cues as natural perceptions do. So physical responses such as jumping at a loud and sudden noise, being horrified by images of the abject or aroused by the erotic, uh, are prompted whether sound and images appear on the screen uh, or in ordinary life. Uh, they also talk about the function of mirror neurons and motor and affective mimicry, which are also activated by sensory inputs, regardless of where they originate. This isn't to say that the resulting uh, cinematic experience can't be given a religious meaning or to argue for cognitive reductionism, but my point is that the ability of film to provoke intense experiences is exactly what needs to be theorized in a religious vein, rather than simply pointed to as evidence of religion. All right, so let me um, turn now to Buddhism uh, and my notion of ritual apparitions as providing a ready explanation of what cinema is and what it does. Now, ritual apparitions is my um, terminology, but it obviously invokes the concept of Nirmanakaya and Sambhogakaya, you know, the manifestation bodies or the uh, enjoyment or communal bodies uh, of the Buddha in contrast to the Dharmakaya, which is the ever abiding but formless body as articulated in Yogacara, Buddhist philosophy. And these are very relevant concepts, but I'm drawing on a much broader uh, conceptual schema uh, articulated by these words, Riddhi, Pratiharya, Abhichnya, and many, many more. Uh, that generally has the meaning of uh, the marvelous, uh, the magical, uh, and transformations which uh, is not just within Buddhism, but generally in Indian religious ritual context uh, uh, with its pervasive belief that ascetic and meditative discipline naturally results in these kinds of marvelous, miraculous powers. Um, and 
Um, I just pulled out this term, vikravana, because uh, it, it's, it has a sort of narrower uh, semantic range, um, the ability to assume multiple forms, uh, transforming the body, uh, and also the power to produce visions of Buddha fields uh, in a small location. So these uh, particular um, ritual apparitions are, are going to be the focus of my theorizing about film. Um, I want to bring uh, the vocabulary here into the East uh, Asian context uh, and the Chinese term shenbian, which is a translation of the notion of these magical transformations. And um, it can be translated as miraculous transformations performed by a Buddha or Bodhisattva for the sake of edifying human beings. Uh, so the moksha, you know, this kind of liberating knowledge um, that is the function of these magical manifestations. And this is why I use the term ritual apparition, because the point of the apparition is to have this edifying religious effect. You know, it's supposed to be liberating. So I'm going to um, talk about some canonical sources, uh, starting with the Avatamsaka uh, Sutra, where this concept of... Um, magical manifestations is pervasive uh, to the text. I've given the uh, Chinese and Korean um, version of the name of the text, the Avatamsaka Sutra, or the Huayan Jing, Huaom Gyeong. Uh, and within the Avatamsaka, uh, I'm focused particularly on the Gandavyuha Sutra. And so if any of you are familiar with the Avatamsaka, you know that it's a collection of how many? 39? Um, independent books that have been, you know, amassed together as one uh, sutra. And the Gandavyuha, um, which is certainly the most well-known book of the Avatamsaka Sutra, is a story. It's a narrative. It tells the story of Sudana, the boy pilgrim, who learns from 52 very diverse uh, enlightening beings, or bodhisattvas, uh, and this is very interesting in that fully 20 of these 52 enlightening beings are women, which is very unusual, uh, including children, both uh, female and male, and uh, many more are also uh, people of secular occupation, not necessarily monks or mendicants uh, or Brahmins, but people who are um, householders, merchants, teachers, perfumers, uh, a sailor, a goldsmith, oh, and also a, a prostitute, right? Uh, the idea being that all manner of beings uh, can function to liberate, right? And can function as your teacher uh, or bodhisattva. So um, Sudana's pilgrimage is a s narrative rendering of what the Gandavyuha describes as the power of the 5,000 great enlightening beings in the Buddha's retinue who are able to manifest in boundless bodies and appear in the world in any physical form uh, that they want. These bodhisattvas understand that humans can't attain enlightenment except by the support, the magic, the empowerment, and the past vows of the enlightened. In other words, except by the power of the bodhisattvas, propitious apparitions, which are manifested by virtue of their advanced practice and their vow to liberate all beings. Although the Gandavyuha is my primary textual source, I want to uh, point out that um, this idea of manif uh, sort of propitious manifestations of bodhisattvas um, is, is a broad concept in the Mahayana Buddhist world. And um, in the East Asian context, the Lotus Sutra, chapter 25, that's dedicated to the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, or otherwise known as Guanyin, uh, or Guanseom in uh, Korean, um, ha has been a, a primary way in which this co concept has disseminated 
culturally, because this chapter talks about how Avalokiteshvara can manifest in 33 different forms, straddling the categories of superhuman, human, uh, and mythical beings. Um, the Shudangama Sutra, which is very important in the uh, Chan, Son, Zen uh, context, talks about the 32 different uh, manifestations of Guanyin with a familiar emphasis of uh, the Bodhisattva appearing in the form that is most propitious and useful uh, for the individual here, right? So if you're uh, a person who has um, political ambitions, then Avalokiteshvara will appear um, as a, um, a magistrate, right, to teach you the Dharma. Or if you tend to be more of a studious, conceptual type of person, then the bodhisattva will appear as a scholar. Uh, so always conforming um, to your needs. And uh, I love this uh, silkscreen image from uh, 10th century China from the Wuye Kingdom um, that pictures the 24 different manifestations uh, of Guanyin and what is so fascinating about what uh, this particular notion of manifestation is that aside from various animals, uh, it pictures the bodhisattva um, appearing as inanimate objects, uh, including like the foot of the Buddha or the hand of the Buddha, even a stone Buddha image. Uh, grass is listed, a bell. Uh, a pavilion, a bridge, uh, a stupa. So, so fascinating that, you know, it can, it can just be things, lifeless objects, as well as different personalities and individuals. So uh, it's no wonder that this flexibility in form allows Guanyin to become a native Chinese goddess starting about the 10th century. Um, who herself is depicted in multiple iconic forms like the white-robed uh, Guanyin or Guanyin with the fish basket. Um, and uh, in Tibet, Avalokiteshvara is expressed in the personage of Tibetan lamas of the Galuk uh, and Karmapa lineages. And of course, the Dalai Lamas are themselves supposed to be historical manifestations of, of the Bodhisattva. Uh, so the soteriological purpose of ritual apparitions lie in their ability to take on such culturally localized and therefore efficacious forms. So my point being that, you know, this isn't just an abstract idea. It's been culturally uh, enacted. Um, but the kind of ritual apparition that interests me the most for talking about film is that of Buddha fields. Um, so, otherwise known as Pure Lands. Um, in the longer Sukhavati Vyuha Sutra, uh, the story is told of uh, how the Buddha Amitabha, in his former life as Dharmakara, vowed to create a, a Pure Land that would be um, accessed by all who called uh, upon his name. And, of course, in the history of Pure Land Buddhism, I'm sure there have been many people who have thought of uh, the Western Pure Land of Amitabha Buddha as an actual physical place in which you can be reborn. But there's also plenty of textual and other discourses that state that you know Buddha fields are a projection of the imagination. Uh, in this case of um, uh, Dharmakara, but also of you know the uh, practitioner. Right, who wishes to be reborn there. Um, the opening of the Lotus Sutra. So I'm just gathering a few examples, certainly not um, comprehensive. Um, what's narrated is the Buddha going into a deep concentration, a beam of light being projected from between his brows, which eliminates uh, what is described as the 18,000 worlds uh, in the eastern direction. Um, and according to various translations of the Lotus Sutra, Maitreya Buddha refers 
uh, to this vision of the Buddha fields as an auspicious portent, a rare apparition, a great wonder, a powerful miracle, all based on the uh, root Sanskrit term nirma, meaning magical transformation. And of course, visions of Buddha fields are a central element in the Ganda Vyuha, and they're distinctive uh, for its emphasis on how they emanate from projections of light coming from very confined spaces, usually the hair pores of the Buddha or the Bodhisattva's uh, body. And um, uh, just a little technical detail, one of the uh, Bodhisattvas that Sudana visits um, in his journey to enlightenment is the goddess of Lumbini. And I think I, I, I can say her name, Sutijo Mandala Ratishri, okay? Um, and in that visit, she explains to Sudana the 10 birth stages of the Bodhisattva and identifies the seventh stage as the stage in which the Bodhisattva can manifest in different bodily forms. And the ninth stage is the point at which uh, the Bodhisattva can project these visions of, of Buddha fields. Um, and in the context of the Avatamsaka, the Buddha fields are described over and over again as coextensive with all phenomena and with the ten directions of space, uh, thus constituting the famous image associated with the Avatamsaka, uh, that of the macrocosm in the microcosm which gets theorized in Huayan Buddhism as the total non-obstruction and mutual interpenetration of all phenomena. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, just this general out outline of Huayan philosophy is something uh, familiar to you. But uh, let me try to sum up some of the more important aspects of these Buddha fields. Uh, first, um, it functions as a visual analog to emptiness. Uh, the abstract concept of emptiness is transformed into an image of non-obstruction in which one can see the entire universe even in a particle of dust. So instead of affirming an abstract and otherworldly realm of formlessness, an unimpeded vision of all things function as, according to uh, David uh, McMahon in his book, Empty Vision, the sensory analog to emptiness. Second, this vision collapses the eons of time normally required to become a Buddha, the holographic principle in which every part contains the whole within itself, removes the separation between past, present, and future, and therefore the distance between samsara and nirvana. Collapsing all of time into the space of an image makes the totality of possibilities always available, including the reality of universal suchness. And, oh, wrong direction, finally, this vision of Buddha fields is a projected image and a deliberate illusion created for the sake of liberating all beings. And um, I want to turn to a different book of the Avatamsaka Sutra, the fourth book called The Formation of the Worlds, um, for some elaboration. Um, in verse form, all the various lands there are filling space in the ten directions sustained by Buddha's mystic power, appear in all places so all can see. The lands manifested in a single atom are all the occult power of the original vow. According to the various differences in inclination of mind, all can be made in the midst of space. So maybe you can see where I'm going with all of this, maybe not, so I'll be explicit at this point. I want to directly analogize these magical apparitions in the form of Buddha fields to cinema, okay? So Buddha is filmmaker. The insubstantiality of the images on the cinematic screen parallels the mythic space of Buddha fields. 
in which visions of infinite Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are granted by the Buddha and the power of his concentration via projections of light. Um, the Gandavyuha emphasizes, one, the magical and illusory nature of these um, I think I'm a little bit behind on the, yeah. Um, the Gandavyuha emphasizes the magical and illusory nature of these appearances, just uh, such as when Maitreya makes his tower disappear with a snap of his finger. So going back to the story of Sudhana, uh, his penultimate um, visit is to the future Buddha Maitreya. And Maitreya gives him a lesson by creating a vision of what's called the Tower of Virochana's Adornments. And this tower symbolizes this macrocosm within the microcosm uh, idea, because when um, Sudana enters the tower, he sees a vast landscape of more towers, exactly like the one that he entered. And the idea is that each tower contains within itself the totality of that landscape of towers, right? And so after he's sort of digested this lesson, what happens? Maitreya snaps his finger and the tower entirely disappears, right? And he says, this is the nature of things characterized by non-fixity. All things are stabilized by the knowledge of enlightening beings. Thus, they are inherently unreal and are like illusions, dreams, reflections. Another parallel. Visual paradox. The macrocosm within the microcosm of the Buddha field is limitless while simultaneously occupying a limited space. Because film is something that is seen, it exists in space. It takes up space. But unlike ordinary objects, cinematic images exist within the bounded space of a screen. In classic cinematic experience, the space is surrounded by darkness that blots out our normal visual field, thereby attracting and guiding our attention. Now, of course, these days, you know, we have portable screens, individual screens, and maybe very few of us experience the classic cinematic, you know, darkened theater experience. Um, and that may detract somewhat from it, but as we were discussing earlier this afternoon, I don't see any evidence, right, that the images on a two-dimensional screen is any less riveting, right, uh, for the advances in technology. Um, within the two-dimensional frame of a movie, moreover, there are limitless possibilities for what can be seen. We can observe things and go places that are otherwise inaccessible to us. And we can also see things constructed from the pure imagination. And going back to the idea of this collapsing of space and time that's so important you know, in, uh, in the Huayan uh, tradition, this is what films do as well within that two-dimensional space. It can play with space and time. It can dilate it uh, or it can shorten it, right? Uh, both uh, time as well as our relation uh, to space. So cinematic um, screens provide the macrocosm within the microcosm, wherein the past, present, and future can be imaged in endless and ever new ways. And so I turn my attention again to book four of the Avatamsaka uh, to pull out these verses. All the vast lands are like reflections, illusions, or flames. Nowhere is their origin seen, know where they can go or whence they came. Some are pure light beams of unknowable origin. These arrays of all light beams rest in empty space. Some are made of pure light and also rest on light rays, embellished with clouds of light where enlightening beings roam. To me, that's a perfect description of cinema, right? Uh, and in, again, in, in the Avatamsaka, the imagery of light, light being projected, you know, from the body uh, of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the ritual apparitions uh, that uh, they image is 
pervasive. So I want to talk about cinema as the superlative ritual apparition. There, uh, uh, in contrast to traditional Buddhist rituals. Now, there are physical three-dimensional temples that are supposed to be concrete instantiations of Buddha fields made for ritual purposes, such as the Temple Borobudur uh, in Indonesia. And we know from the images on Borobudur that um, the um, Gandavyuha is a central text uh, for this temple. But in comparison to monuments made of stone, cinematic images are closer to the insubstantial projections generated by Buddhas. Cinematic visions can be projected at will, at any time, and at multiple locations. But they can also instantly disappear. Aha, this is my little <laughs> neat visual trick. Um, just like Maitreya's tower. Uh, when Sudana asked Maitreya, where did that um, tower come from and where did it go? Maitreya answers, it does not go or come at all. It is not abiding or fixed in existence. It is not located in any place. So in contrast to monuments, cinematic images are spectral. Right, and again, so much closer to the idea of a ritual apparition. And because of its spectral nature, it is also vastly more available as an experience than uh, the Temple Borobudur is. Turning to another uh, traditional uh, ritual instantiation of the idea of uh, the macrocosm within the microcosm, um, uh, and this is my homage to Korean Buddhism. Uh, I want to look at the Popkedo of Isang, who is the founder of Korean Hwaom Buddhism based on the Avatamsaka Sutra. So this image, uh, which is a version of a mandala, um, is comprised of 210 Chinese characters broken up into a 30-verse poem which Isang in his own auto-commentary describes as a darani, right? But it's also supposed to be a condensation of the entire Avatamsaka Sutra. And you're supposed to travel through this maze, starting at the center with the character for Dharma, uh, going in and out through all four quadrants, and then ending back up at the center uh, with the character for Buddha. Right? The idea being that once you have traveled, you have attained uh, Buddhahood. Uh, so this is symbolic. It's interesting to me how, however, um, it's been turned into a um, processional uh, popkedo. Popkedo means a diagram of the Dharma Dhatu uh, on the grounds of the Yaksasa temple near uh, in Chun, uh, in Seoul. This to me speaks to the desire on the part of Buddhists to move beyond symbolism to concrete experiences that take place in time. Again, much like film. Uh, cinema creates experiences of intense physicality in its sensory nature, even while it is entirely spectral uh, and insubstantial. So, I want to talk about cinema as superlative ritual practice. Um, perhaps one of the most intense ritual experiences in the Buddhist world are the visualizations performed by individuals who generate their own mind movies in order to instantiate, for example, the Pure Land of Amitabha. Such practitioners are guided by textual instructions, perhaps actual images, and aided by other ritual means, such as chanting, fasting, sleep deprivation, which probably is conducive uh, to, to having visions. Um, I would say, again, cinema is comparatively closer to the ritual apparition of Buddha fields that are generated by the Buddha, uh, because these Buddha fields are always for a collective body. So again, I'm suggesting, I, I, I see this 
as a better ritual practice than the individual visualization um, traditions. Okay. Um, furthermore, understanding the comparatively new technology of film as a ritual apparition helps to actualize the Buddhist concept at an unprecedented level of concrete practice, going beyond what has primarily been narrated as a story. The Gandavyuha describes Sudhana's experiences and attempts to put images of them into our heads. Cinema isn't limited to narration. It gives us a direct experience of the story. Now, these points so far may illuminate why it's useful for Buddhists to think of film as ritual apparitions. But maybe it's not so clear what non-Buddhists have to gain from it, particularly if you don't believe that movies are granted by the compassionate vows of bodhisattvas and their magical power to generate illusions. That may be the case, but I think this gives short shrift to the Buddhist theory which underscores the point that these apparitions are, in fact, illusions. For this realization is the main point of the ritual. And I'm, for a nice summation of this, I'm going to draw uh, from an old article by Luis Gomez, uh, The Bodhisattva is Wonder Worker, which is all about, um, again, the Gandavyuha. Uh, and uh, Gomez has, to, has this to say about the wonder working uh, of the bodhisattvas. His creations, though conforming to the delusions of his audience, are presented in order to reveal the true nature of the delusion, unlike the magician who rests content with the success of his deception. OK, so final slide. Knowledge of the technology and industry by which cinema is generated does not undermine this lesson. It actually magnifies the point that what we see, hear, and feel through cinema is completely and deliberately manufactured. This is the starting point in our common knowledge of film, whereas it's the ideal culminating point of Buddhist practice. So for this reason, I think film is a catapulting mechanism for Buddhism or Buddhists who want to convey that our perceptions of reality are also completely and deliberately manufactured. Western epistemic contexts generally, in contrast, are distracted by the holy grail of referential realism and thus produces discourses about the paradox of fiction which problematizes the fact that people believe what they see in the movies, even, they, even though they know it's not real. And so I think what goes missing in, in making this a problem is a marveling over the fact that this paradox right, of the simultaneous falsity and reality of film is exactly where its magic and religious power lies. Okay. Now, there is a way in which current film theory, I think, um, converges with my Buddhist one, in that film theory tends to unmask the potential ideological manipulations uh, of film. I'm willing to call this an anemic version of the Buddhist theory because Buddhists, too, constantly warn us uh, against the deceptions of our own mind movies. But modern film theory, I call anemic to the degree that it doesn't get past the fear of cinematic deceptions to appreciate what these very deceptions reveal and enable in the realm of human experience itself. And I, I think one thing that is cl clearly enabled are salutary experiences uh, as evaluated from the Buddhist point of view. Say, take the concept of kusala, right, versus akusala, you know, experiences that are wholesome uh, and skillful. Um, so a way in which cinema is a 
superlative ritual practice is how it encourages, for example, the cultivation of intentionality. Because we know cinematic experience is constructed, we can critique it. On the other hand, because we palpably experience the miracle of cinematic apparitions, it can cultivate awareness, and for that reason, possibly purposiveness about how we choose to have our imaginations exercised. Okay, and um, as a final word, I want to go back to the neat separation I made between a Buddhist theory of film and a Buddhist movie. I, I do hold to uh, the disclaimer that the medium of cin cinema itself doesn't make all movies Buddhist, but a theory usually wants to be universally applicable. And so any theory worth its salt should be capable of addressing any instance of cinema or filmmaking. I don't think that necessarily makes every movie Buddhist, but we might kind of edge or creep in that direction in that theories also impact our thinking. And once an idea is out there, um, then I think it can become the lens through which all cinematic experiences are um, um, understood and evaluated, whether it is in the uh, wholesome or unwholesome uh, direction. So with that, I'll <laughs> conclude. Thank you for your attention uh, and patience. And I'm hoping that there is time for comments and, and questions. So um, please um, ask away. Yeah, surely. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Fran. Uh, one of the things that came to my mind listening to you is you had this tradition in the history of religions of an interest in cinema that Eliana had. Mm. That mm -hmm. I just wondered if there's a modern man that experienced something what archaic man. Mm -hmm. The idea in this one for Eliana, that in the, the, ritual, the, the ritual experience, the person mm -hmm. lost awareness of themselves and entered into this uh, mythic. Yes. For Eliana, the analogies were, I'm not aware of myself watching a movie. I'm entering into the world of the movie, and my own world that I'm actually in is disappearing. That's right. So I'm in there. Yeah. The key notion is, that the, the film viewer loses awareness of herself. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The inverse. That yes. The key notion is that the film viewer uh, gains, she has greater awareness of her, the means of perception. So that contrast for me then raises this other question about the nature of the theory that you're proposing. Mm -hmm. And so is a theory to be tested empirically somehow? Right, right. Because some theories are that way. Yeah. Or some theories are, they're not to be tested. They're assumed to be, in some fundamental sense, false. But their falsity reveals something that's true in the phenomenon. Hmm. That really, so the theory is premised on the as if quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Representational quality. Right, so right. Our theory, which is... Well, um, maybe there's an alternative here, option, uh, which is what I was trying to allude to with my final comment. Theories are not isolated from what they describe. I don't think they should be. So it's true. My theory is not describing probably the vast majority of uh, the experiences or the consciousness that people have when they watch films. You know, um, I think it is a lot more like what Iliada described. And to me, 
therefore it's a ritual space, right? Because you're leaving ordinary time and space and entering another realm and having an experience. And you know, the traditional cinematic setup to me is very much like a, um, a ritual uh, being enacted. Um, but my idea is that once you articulate this as if theory, then is it not the case that the experience, your experience of watching movies will change to this one of greater self-reflexivity that might not have been there before? So it's an activist theory. But I've kind of lost track of what your other option was. You were, you were talking about, you know, describing actual historical reality versus... Uh, let me ask a question on you know, how to think about what happens to us in a, let's just say, a movie theater. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not about, like, my iPhone. Right, right. The relationship of what's happening in the movie theater to what's outside of the movie theater. Right. And for Eliana, the, the theory was a premise on they are different in kind. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you come out of the theater, you're blinking in the light, and you all of a sudden you say, oh, it's, it's only 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Right. I forgot what time of day it was. Right. Daylight. Yeah. The other, what I would take as your theory, is that they're not different in kind. They're That's in right. Degree. And so when I come out of the movie theater, my sense of my self-reflexivity over how I perceive the world is transformed by Exactly. Now I'm aware I'm constantly manufacturing. That's right. Thank you. I mean, perfectly stated. Um, and it is the role of the theory to trigger that change in experience, is all I would add to it. Because if you think about it, I mean, anyone who really thinks about the movies really thinks about their experience in watching one, if you sustain that meditation long enough, I mean, it has to strike anyone as completely paradoxical and inexplicable. And the fact that, you know, we talk about these images and fictional events uh, no differently, you know, from our own life experiences there is something mind-bogglingly strange about it. So this is, this is the, the kind of consciousness or awareness that I think needs to be fostered, which I think in more academic, traditional thinking about film and film theory doesn't, doesn't I, I don't see such a sensitivity or a marveling at that, at that fact. I, I see suspicion of it, although I think there are glimmers in some of these early French theorists, as we were talking about earlier today. Uh, Charlie was talking about Deleuze, um, another figure prior to Deleuze, uh, Edgar Morin. Um, I mean, they film made such cinema made such an impact on philosophers in the early 20th century because they recognized that there's something about this experience which is unprecedented. Right, that there's a there's a power to it, and um, you know people talked uh, likened it to myth and dream, uh, fantasy and so forth. But I think the interpretive directions just went in, in in this more sort of oh I don't know materialistic the semiotic uh, the psychoanalytical uh, directions, and so that sense of wonder has has been somewhat lost. I guess I. Um, where I'm still trying to think this through is like what the cinema you're assuming or you're you're described you seems to me you're speaking to a certain mode of cinema that perhaps that has fundamentally changed today and I feel like so much of um, what's happening in cinema today is actually about um, meditating upon the illusion of of cinema and upon the illusion. Mm -hmm of narrative, oftentimes for really explicit political purposes. Um, and I think that 
Mm -hmm. So, I just, I guess what I, I'm trying to understand, I feel like this idea of a Buddhist theory of film perhaps could work if better if it was actually focused on, I think, universalizing cinema. I, I'm still having trouble with that. Mm -hmm. I think about, you know, early cinema, and, and I think about its connection, actually, to the church. Um, and I think about the certain, the, the religiosity of the early cinematic image and the ways in which, actually, the church itself embraced it. Um, mm -hmm. in the West. And the ways in which, you know, cinematic illusionism was from the very beginning, beginning linked with an idea of something sacred and going back to sort of the, uh, I don't know, spirit photography and things like that. Yeah. But I think where we are today is so fundamentally different. I see, you know, so many films that um, turn in on themselves, that consume themselves, that mm -hmm. destroy themselves midway in ways that force us to think differently about what is the image itself. Right. That's something that I feel like when you talk about the Buddha as a um, filmmaker and he sort of, you know, the lights, like a projection in some way. But then I'm thinking, like, okay, what's the image? I mean, I guess I just, I want to understand, I want, I'm just hungry to see this theory applied and I want to see to which object, right? It, what, what are we going to see when we start, how, what are we going to experience that's, 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 that, you know, that's perhaps different but speaks to cinema today and not necessarily cinema of, you know, of the classical era, of the uh, theatrical film, and of the time when the cinema theater itself was indeed a communal space that doesn't... Right, right. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to think about this on all these levels and to give it some, some historical uh, foundation. Good, good. I mean, that would be a very useful thing um, although what you describe as cinema today, I, I don't see as being uh, as falling outside of my theoretical structure. In fact, I, I think it's very much in line with it. I mean, it makes sense to me that maybe initially there's a fixation of the idea of cinematic images as uh, objectively, objectively portraying the world. Uh, as it is because it's mechanically produced and dependent on what is actually out there uh, in the world, independent, you know, of um, human manipulations. Um, and then the, the meditations have advanced to the stage where there is this direct self-reflexive uh, querying, right, of the, the honesty or the objectivity or the purposiveness of, of cinema, that seems to me like it's going exactly in the direction that I want the theory as well uh, to enable. But your point of recognizing different phases of uh, cinematic uh, uh, context and discourse I, I think is a very important one. I guess maybe the idea I'm grappling with is like cinematic illusionism, and I feel like that's something that cinema's grappled with from the very beginning. And mm -hmm. you think of a figure like George Medias, mm -hmm. where it is about, so, and I feel like, you know, the myth of cinematic realism mm -hmm. and of this, the myth of the paradox, right, of people, first audience being frightened by the train. Right. This is a foundational myth of the power of cinema. Yeah. Where cinema itself is grappled with and contradicted from the very, right, beginning. And so I guess, that contradiction that I'm looking for to find somewhere within this theory. A contradiction. Oh, okay. So this idea that yes, so this this naive realism or myth of it can right. exist alongside this you know self-reflexive, self-conscious right rupture mm -hmm. with reality, mm -hmm. and maybe in fact the two sides are the same. I I think so, uh, because. I experience that every time when I watch a movie, that simultaneous, you know, I know that this is manufactured, and yet my experience of it is not, is not, um, um, what is it, uh, diminished, 
for that knowledge. So it's, it's interesting to me that you've had, you know, this tradition of talking about, yes, the, I, uh, who were the brothers who did the train arriving at, yeah, the or brothers, and yes, this fable, this legend about how people ran uh, uh, away because, you know, it was so uh, realistic. I see in that this meditation, this, you know, self-reflexivity about the medium itself, which is holding intention, right? Um, this uh, uh, sort of unavoidable experience of this kind of sense of, of the real. But yeah, Charlie. Um, so actually, the follow on this question a bit, I think. Uh, I have a reaction and then a question. The reaction will take a little bit longer to articulate. Um, but it, it, it feels to me as if you, you have used Western philosophical um, approaches to film as something of a foil. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm willing to admit that that's how it, it has begun. Uh, and I need to, of course, make it more than just a foil because I am interested in substantive resonances, um, but, you know, just getting my toes wet uh, okay. at this point. Well, so then I'll, I'll, I'll be briefer in my remarks, then, which is that yeah, I'm not up to speed on Western philosophical theories of film, but one of my teachers was Stanley Cavell. Mm. And I think the world viewed is like 1972 or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And there, you're right that that to take him as an instance that he's looking at film through Western epistemological categories, but it's not driven by a desire to land at some sort of naive realism and mm -hmm. establish mm -hmm. the objective right. world, uh, the world objectively, and then measure the distances that representations have to that. But it's it's a much more sophisticated, in his case, account of how we are, uh, how we treat the problem of skepticism, and I say treat <clears throat> deliberately because he regarded it as a kind of condition that needed constant therapy. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's all to say that if I think Cavell doesn't fit your, your okay. uh, characterization, and that's in 1972, I can imagine that things are more sophisticated in the subsequent, uh, that is to say, I just, it's hard for me to think that Western philosophical treatments of film fail to be sophisticated about this knowledge in the way that I feel like you characterize it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can react, do you want to react to that and then I'll pose the question? Well, uh, just briefly, um, I think there is a lot in uh, the philosophical um, thinking. I've been looking primarily at um, explicit um, conversations about religion in film, or the spiritual in film, which is a, a smaller subset. And I do feel like there is more resource uh, in the philosophical meditations that's not concerned about the category of religion per se. So that, that's where, you know, um, I think more can be said. But go ahead. Let me take up your, your, your proposal. Nicely, um, or maybe it was a quote of someone else here that the delusions presented in and through film are there in order to reveal the true nature of the delusion. Right, so right. Have a kind of almost didactic quality. Mm -hmm. uh, how does narrative or the sequence of images work on this theory? How is it that by sitting for an hour, two hours, three hours, and how, do, how does a sequence of delusions work to initiate you into the, into the realization that everything is delusion? I guess it's a simple way to put this question is, how important is narrative to your theory of film? It's very important because my work has been on fiction, right? On, on literature. Um, uh, so particularly fiction 
uh, that is designed to capture the emotions, uh, the emotional engagement, the interest. Uh, so, you know, in the tale of Genji, right, there's a discourse right in the middle of that novel, which is described as the world's first novel written by a woman about affairs of the heart, right, which is why it's lasted all these centuries, whereas all the writings, the political writings of the men of the same era, no one is really all that interested in except for, for the specialist, uh, where she says this kind of narrative um, is true. It's true because of its ability to engage us, right? And give us an experience of what the characters were going through and to capture our imagination and, you know, all of those things that, that we credit literature for doing. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, I think, well, you know, how is film or cinema on a different level? Well, as a audiovisual sensory experience, it is very much on a different level. Um, and um, I think with film, you can do more than just tell stories. I mean, you can have different kind of cinematic uh, experiences, which in fact defy the norms of storytelling. So I've, I've um, explored th those kinds of films too as um, kind of cultivating uh, this uh, ritually, this ability uh, to perceive experiences and perhaps the world more generally in the absence of conceptual constructions and meaning making, right? Uh, so that's that's something, uh, I mean, I think that would be much harder to pull off in, oh, although I guess more modernistic novels do attempt to uh, foil or go against the conventions of storytelling, right? Um, so it, it, it just seems to me that um, uh, the level of uh, possibilities, however, is greater. Uh, so going back to the uh, macrocosm and the microcosm, what you can stage or enable in that two-dimensional space is just utterly mind-boggling, right? And I, I think that is the part of its magical nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the, for lack of a better word, something revolving around the notion of taste. Mm. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk. I really enjoyed your book. And you bring up different sort of examples of the kind of project that you're doing relative to specific films in each chapter. And all of these films are, I agree with you, masterpieces. Um, but I want to ask you about mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, of which there are no, there's no shortage. Um, what do you do when you watch a bad film? Right. Um, I think it's very instructive watching bad right. films, and yeah. This is actually what I want to hear about because part of your theory is deploying ideas from Huayan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And when I think of Huayan, one of the things that comes to my mind is my field work for my dissertation uh, was, is with a community that takes Huayan to be their really central preoccupation and people think about it all the time. And, uh, you know, I was in the field when um, there was this terrorist attack in Paris. So everyone's like talking about this. And one of the people I was speaking with, you know, we were talking about this kind of problem, terrorism, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he said that for him, crisis, um, Huayan Fajia, adorns the Dharma realm. So there's a capaciousness in the theory whereby both the good and the bad are subject to a kind of greater yes. order. Right. So I'm wondering what you think about bad movies, and is there something you, is there advice bad you Bad in a different sense than terrorist attack, right? Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I'm talking about actually just because structurally, in terms of avatantic thought, it has this capacity to bring in extremes on either. Right. That's like the whole point, right? Exactly. So you can learn from a prostitute. 
to you know become liberated, right? Nothing is beyond the the pale. Yeah, yeah. So this gets back to that uh, kind of liminal space between defining a, a Buddhist movie, which uh, presumably is a movie that works in towards skillfulness, right? You know, uh, wholesomeness. You know that it helps you advance uh, on the path versus a theory, a Buddhist theory of film that is capacious in the same way that Huayan is, that can look at all instances of cinema, including bad movies, including uh, movies that perhaps we um, are concerned with in terms of what its social effects or you know um, uh, effects on individuals in terms of sexual behavior, social norms, so on. Uh, and so forth. Um, with the consciousness of the power of these images, then that too becomes fodder for reflection on the power of such constructions uh, that might have uh, over us or our reflection on why the movies are bad. Uh, and and undesirable, I think, is part of the same process. So, I mean, it's good to say that's a bad movie because to me, the way it depicts people and relationships and life in general is unbelievable, right? I mean, whatever the criticism might be, but I also at the same time hesitate to uh, create something like a Buddhist movie rating system, you know, like, yeah, B for definitely Buddhist and, and you know, uh, F or N for non-Buddhist, because I think the point is, um, in the Huayan world, even the bad stuff, if you, if you are aware of it, right, appropriately can become good stuff. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, if you talk about the effects, the, so I, I'm not willing to say that um, certain kinds of movies are inherently bad from the perspective of the Buddhist project, if you will. I think it really, I, I mean, yeah, so I was getting pushback from some of my graduate students on, on the same issue, you know. Are, are there certain movies that are just simply unacceptable? Um, I'm, I'm not willing to, to say that because I, I think the nature of the experience is not inherent in the film or the work itself, but in the meeting between the audience and, and the work. And um, you know, the, the principle of skillfulness entails no sort of absolute definition or determination of what is, what is useful and what is not, right? So I think bad movies for different reasons could be very useful. Yes. Um, I may be repeating, I think, some of the questions, maybe in a slightly different form that others have raised, but I'm really puzzled, and I, I don't mean this in an adversarial sense, but I'm just wondering what the value of this, of this theory is mm -hmm. um, for, for, committed, for committed Buddhists who mm -hmm. don't need, I think, to go to the cinema to Mm. Um, experience the kind of realization that you're talking about. We can look at this room, we can look at you, maybe you're an illusion, we can, we can think this way uh, by, by contemplating almost, almost anything. Mm -hmm. And for the, um, for the non-Buddhist, um, and also for the Buddhist, it seems to me that um, thinking about film or experience of thinking of film in the way that you have described the skillfulness actually detracts from the enjoyment and pleasure and actual philosophical enlightenment 
of a great film. Um, huh. In the same in the same way that one could approach, say, Shakespeare literature, a, a great play mm -hmm. or anything, um, uh, with that kind of Buddhist skillfulness and and subvert what is actually um, a great artistic pleasure. What, how does it subvert it? Could I could I ask you for? Some elaboration on that, because of this level of uh, reflecting yes, on the, ultimate, the medium. The ultimate, the purpose of, of the film, mm. um, the recognition, I guess, of the uh, illusory character of, of existence. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It seems to me there are many great values to a beautiful piece of literature, oh. a great film, that uh. enhance our lives. That's exactly the point. That your theory actually um, subverts. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe I'm misunderstanding your theory, but, but it seems to me that I, I would... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose, I suppose it's uh, uh, along the lines of the complaint that, you know, taking apart Shakespeare from whatever academic interpretive angle uh, just ruins Shakespeare, right? if you're considering all of the other sort of extraneous um, uh, elements and um, uh, variables that went into creating a Shakespearean play. W would it be something along those lines that you just got to enjoy the phenomenon for itself as it is rather than um, disenchanting it with, with the theory? Perhaps, but I think maybe going back to the original question, has to do with the appreciation of the falsity, if you will. Mm -hmm. But the falsity is enhancing. Yes. That it yes. Humanizing. Yes. That it in, it in, it uh, enlightens us in, in, in many ways. Right. Um, so I don't really want to depart from that falsity. I want to uh, revel in it. I want to enjoy it. I guess that's what I'm saying. I yeah yeah, and I don't think. Any amount of theorizing in any vein will take away that capacity to enjoy and revel in the illusion. But the ultimate purpose seems to be quite the opposite. To recognize that this is a falsity. Um, whereas I would like to say that the falsity that you're suggesting could also be a great truth, a great humanistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't see that in a sense as, as, as false. Well, let me say that what I want to do is export that vision of the falsity of, of film to our lives itself or themselves. So it's, it's not to detract from the experience of cinema, but rather to enhance the experience of the falsity of life in the way that we enjoy watching a movie. So that, I, I but, I mean, you, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, 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 I mean. Can I suggest, Francine, as both of you are going to be at the dinner afterwards and we continue. Okay, sure, uh, sure. Complimentary and antithetical. Um, we, I'm afraid we've gone over the time scheduled. Um, which is always a good sign. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So um, thank you again very much for this. Thank you to all of you. <laughs>